I played Heroes of Might and Magic 1 for the first time recently, and now... The second one. The same, but different, plus one, is how I would describe it. You got your heroes, your might, and your magic, and the game plays basically the same way, but it looks different, and there's more of it. There's a plus one to every attribute. There's more units, more settlement types, more buildings, more spells, more hexagons on the battle grid, more options, more frames of animation, more choice when it comes to leveling up, more campaign levels, more story, more Roman numerals. It even has more expansions. One instead of zero, which the CD version I have comes with. I actually don't know if this title screen is part of the expansion or not. It probably is. Oh, and look how dark it is. You know what they say, red sky, die. I have to say, it's almost sad that it's not as funny as before, with the extremely happy colourful sprites and intro screen. This is much more serious. There's a cool video cutscene for the beginning of the campaign that sets the tone pretty well. Let's talk about that first. The campaign is much more engaging than before. I barely understood the point of the campaign story in the first game. It was just a bit of text that explains your general objective. In this game, the campaign is truly a campaign. There's a king who dies, and there are two sons who want the throne. One was good. Roland was good. And one was not. Archibald was not so good. I mean, you say that, but I'd question the reliability of the artist who painted these portraits. He seems to have quite the bias if you ask me. Am I being led astray? No, it's just a fictional black and white fairy tale scenario where good and evil is clearly defined to make it a fun video game. It is not complex at all. Oh, and how fun a video game it is. If you choose the good boy, you follow a rebellion to take back the crown because the nasty boy used shady underhanded tactics to pronounce himself king. If you choose the bad boy, you're trying to retain control of your crown and crush the rebellion. But much of that is just fluff. The gameplay isn't affected much by the story. None of the settlement types are exclusive to one side or the other. And like last time, you can take over an enemy castle and buy units from said castle for your own army, and you can recruit any type of hero that you like. So really, nothing changed. The story is just there to set the scene and to give context to a victory. I didn't get all the way through the campaign on either side yet, but I very much want to see what happens at the end. I'm hoping for another FMV. There's just something about them I like. I like these screens too. They're not videos, are they? W what do you call them? Is it possible to describe a PC game graphic as rustic? Because that's the word that comes to mind when I see this. It's It's got graininess to it. But it's nice. And it's like cool and fucking sick. You know what I mean? The gameplay. Moving your heroes around the land, picking up piles of treasure, claiming resources and fighting wild packs of enemies is the same as before, but the number of things you can spend your spoils on has increased. Now, in addition to creating buildings for soldiers, you can upgrade those buildings to create more powerful versions of those soldiers. Not every building has this feature, but a lot of them do, multiplying the customizability of the stuff. What's great is that you can upgrade lower tier versions of the units once you upgrade the building. This increases the investment potential of the castles, making them more valuable to hold onto and devastating to lose, making defense a much more important factor in the game than before. And in line with that, there are now ways to enhance the structural integrity of the castle. You can give it fortifications and extra turrets, a moat which stops enemies in their tracks, and a captain that can help defend it from attacks when your heroes aren't there, multiplying the customizability of the stuff. Similarly, on the other side, you can now get skills as heroes that increase your ability with the fucking this. You can, you can increase the magic bitch power to crush the walls with the fucking rocks. You can make rocks crush the walls better if your hero gets the fucking powers to do that. It's pretty cool. There's also a market where you can trade surplus resources for ones you need more urgently. There was this one time where I was severely outnumbered. All the other enemies had been conquered by the yellow player and I was unable to venture out to capture a crystal mine that I really needed to purchase cyclopses that I, I just, I fucking needed cyclopses. 
so instead I had to use the market to slowly purchase crystals and hold the fort until I had a large enough army to fight back. Which leads me on to another point. These games take a long time and a lot of patience. Like in the first game, once you start losing it's hard to claw your way back, but it's not impossible. It just requires a bit of turtling up in your castles and making defensive plays for many, many turns. Being holed up in my castle trading for crystals was one of these situations. I had no map control. Yellow had taken every other castle and was systematically lapping up every resource and artifact and treasure and I couldn't afford to leave my castle to challenge them because they had way more heroes and soldiers than I did and if I left my castle undefended or even minimally defended, it would be taken or my hero would die out in the field or both and that's a game over. I was considering giving up at this point, but I wanted to see if it was possible to win. And also I've been playing for a fucking long time, so you know, I'm just gonna persevere. And I hatched a plan. If the AI had five heroes running around and three castles and spread all their soldiers out evenly, the only way I would be able to beat them would be to over fuck them with a big army and take them out one by one. Uh, in order to make a big army, you need lots of resources, and I couldn't really go out and get resources, so I just had to sit in my castle, slowly accruing gold. And that's what I did. So on the income of one castle, admittedly with a lot of fully upgraded buildings, I just sat there and waited, turn after turn, buying units when I could, and amassing an army strong enough to survive more than one battle. It took a long time, in which I think the AI picked clean the entire map of treasure, but eventually I managed to pull through, and I- and they dead. It was intense, and it was strategically simulating. But by god it was a slog. It took over two hours for that one game, that's only like mission two of the evil campaign. There's a reason I didn't complete the campaign before making this video. It's a very long thing to do. And I don't mean any of that in a bad way, it's just very easy when you start off slightly unlucky, to throw in the towel and try again. I have actually noticed that you begin each game with randomized stuff. Sometimes you might have a well or a statue in your castle, or two unit buildings instead of one. Sometimes it feels like it's worth restarting over and over again to get good RNG with this, but I don't like Rigan. It annoys me. I don't like min maxing fucking video games. It hurts my head and I don't enjoy it. Give me a spreadsheet and I'll spread that right up my ass. <laughs> I don't know what that means. There are six hero types now instead of four. Knights having their medieval castles, sorceresses with their elves and fairies, warlocks with their gargoyles and minotaurs, barbarians with orcs, goblins and trolls, and introducing wizards with iron golems and pigs, and necromancers with zombies and skeletons. Now, necromancers I get because of the hero Sandro in the first game. Well, I mean, he doesn't seem like a warlock type. He's no, got no face. Having him be a necromancer makes a whole lot more sense. And also skeletons are cool. And would you look at those vampires? They literally go blur when they attack. It's a Dracula. I got you with me hands. Why aren't you using his, your fangs? You're a vampire. You just push them over. I don't... Uh, wizards are a little strange though. I love the iron golems. The way they shuffle around and metally clanky clonky around is, is very funny. But the rocks? That's basically the griffins, which already exist. It's a bird guy. The halfling? That seems like it would make more sense with the sorceress, with the dwarves and the elves and stuff. The boars? Why, why, what is the boars? Why, uh, why boars and Greek giant titan weird things from like Jason and the Argonauts? What is this? I, this doesn't, I don't get this, like, this theme. The magi make the most sense, because they're like magicians. But what do any of these other things have to do with wizards, exactly? I don't really mind that, it's just odd. The combat is much the same as the first game. Units move on a hexagonal grid, you can cast spells when it's your turn, but only once per cycle. Like if you cast a spell before you move a unit, you can't cast another spell until you get to that unit's turn again. And that's, that's how that works. One addition I love is the ability to turn on a visible grid, and how far your unit can move on the grid before you move them. Makes it feel like you're more in control of what you're doing now. 
The animations are much better too, though sometimes it feels like there are too many frames to some animations. Like when the troll throws their rock, there's like a second and a half of animation of the troll making a new boulder out of thin air before I can click on anything. Most of the time I'm focusing on the number of enemies I killed and not at the troll, so I consistently feel like the game is lagging every time it happens. Like what does it make sense to make a rock out of nothing? I don't need to see that, I could just assume you pick another one up. The combat feels slower because of things like this, and I don't hate it, but there's something to appreciate about the jerky, efficient animations of the first game. And also, you know, they're just so funny. Some of the units move exceptionally slow as well. The mummies, for instance, can travel quite a distance in one turn, but they shuffle along the floor really slowly. I guess that's just another plus one for heroes too. More time spent watching the soldiers move around. There are more minute things to talk about. I didn't even mention that when a hero levels up, you have a chance to choose between two different perks. That's good, but there's not really much to say about it. It's just nice. Just like more customizability of the stuff. But yes, to conclude, it's the same, but different, plus one. It's definitely a better game overall, but I still think the first one has a lot of charm. And so I expect to be playing both of these games for a long time. They have their things about them that they like. I like both of them. Good on you, whoever made it. You did it twice. You did good things twice. And there we have it. I reviewed Heroes 2. Lots of people want to see what I think of Heroes 3 as well, and so that'll be coming up at some point. People keep telling me that it's the best one, so I can't wait. Uh, so subscribe to see that when it comes out. Support me on Patreon if you want to support me making videos. And the, that's the end. Come back in February.